Welcome, Paula, to the Happier at Work podcast. I'm so excited for this conversation this morning that we're going to have. Do you want to let people know a little bit about your history, how you got to do what you're doing today? Morning, Eva. It's so nice to be here. We, yeah, I've been look, really looking forward to this conversation. I've been I've enjoyed the podcast so far. So um, yeah, I'm Paula Sheridan. My background is almost all pharmaceuticals, and I spent about 25 years in pharmaceuticals in a variety of roles. Um, and part of that was I then became an internal coach and I really enjoyed that in the company that I was in. And then when redundancy came along, it was too good an offer to miss. So I, I decided to put my money where my mouth was and where I'd been saying, oh, well, you know, if I get redundancy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off and be a coach and, and I'm going to help women build their confidence and do this and that. And so that's what I did. So now what I do is I work with, um, frustrated professional women who are really pissed off at yet another, I should have checked whether swearing was all right, shouldn't I? They're really pissed <laughs> off that yet another less experienced person has overtaken them at work. And what I help them to do is to learn how to get their value recognized and appreciated so that, you know, next time it's them. Yeah. 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 They get the attention they deserve. We, we like to keep it real here on the podcast. Some guests swear, some don't. And I mean, some people don't even think that, that <laughs> saying pissed off is a swear. So it's all good. It's all good. Um, and it's so funny, Paula, like I've been um, connected with you on LinkedIn for a while. I've been really, really yeah. enjoying your content. The posts are Thank so you. relatable. Like I totally get it. And I was one of those women where that happened, where someone who I felt was less experienced and um, not as good at the role without him. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, without, without tooting my own horn, but someone, you know, that's definitely happened a few times. And I think people can yeah. relate to that, that, you know, here we go yet again. And maybe I'd love to get in your experience. Um, is it, is it men typically who, who, who that is? So in my own personal experience, it was a man who was absolutely less experienced than I was. I was being promised this role and then he was promoted to be my manager. And I got mm. such a shock mm. because it also, not only was he promoted to be my manager, it wasn't communicated to me at all. Um, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Oh God. That's, that's, that's awful. Yeah. Um, the, some, the people that I speak to tend to be women. Yeah. So it tends, it tends to be women who get in touch with me. Um, so you know, I can't say this never happens to men. It's just, yeah. this is the sample well, that I see. It's, it's more when this does happen, is it that a less experienced man was promoted and not, you know, not to kind of brandish all men as, as uh, evil or, but oh, I God, think no. we have no, no, different no. ways of being recognized at work. And I think women really struggle with that. And we'll probably go on yes. to talk a little bit more about that. Yes. Um, it does quite often tend to be men who get promoted over women and again this is not a rant this is not about um man bashing no at all. no no it's not intended not. to be that way but you know we know that into most workplaces graduate intake into into professional roles is pretty much equal men and women yeah. certainly yeah. in my experience in pharmaceuticals it is and there's data to, to um, support that and there's data to support the wider professional um, in the UK as well, that, you know, they come in equal numbers. But then when you look at the numbers of managers, so the proportions of men and women who then become managers, that's when there is a disparity. So this gap opens up quite early and, it, and then it widens. And the perceived wisdom was always, well, you know, women go off and have children, don't they? And then they, they decide they don't want their career to be so important. Um, but the gap happens before that. Mm. So there may well be pressures that having a family puts on someone. And that's, I mean, that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah. Um, but the gap opens before that. And probably the gap then exacerbates the pressure that's put on women because women are then less likely to be the major earner. They're, le they're less likely to be, have a bigger career, that sort of thing. So when they do become parents, theirs is, Theirs is the, theirs is the job that can afford to go part time. Yeah, it becomes because, less important. Exactly, yeah. and yeah. then that, and then from there it spirals, but it starts before they, they have children, and, I mean, I don't know about you, but I entered the workplace assuming that 
what would make a difference and what would help you advance is working, you know, working hard and doing a good job. And that was what is necessary. But um, one lesson I wish I had learned an awful lot earlier <laughs> is that there are two things that are important in the workplace, in a professional workplace. And those two things are influence and visibility. Now, influence is the getting stuff done, is working with other people, working out what needs doing, um, who can help you do that? What are the needs of that person and that person and tying them all together? Influence is the doing your job and getting things done. Um, and you can be absolutely brilliant at that. The visibility part is the critical bit because if nobody knows that it was you that did it, you're not going to get the credit. Yeah. And you start out in a professional role um, with quite a lot of supervision because frankly, you have no idea what you're doing and you could be dangerous and you know you could do all kinds of stuff, you know, yeah. stuff could go very wrong. Yeah. So, you know, you have a lot of supervision so people can see what you are doing. They know what you are doing. Then as you progress onto another couple of jobs, you know, you know what you're doing. You don't need that much supervision. So the only time you become visible is if you tell people what you're doing or if you cock something up. Mm. And so if you're just sailing yeah. a nice steady ship um, and you're not causing any problems and you're not asking for help, then nobody really knows what you're doing. And more and more as you get further on in your career, what your job becomes about is actually mitigating risk and anticipating problems and yeah. ensuring that things carry on in a nice straight line. So there Therefore, are fewer if nothing goes wrong yeah you're doing no a good one, job no but nobody you. knows <laughs> yeah exactly so you know i often talk about sort of the sailing a steady ship where um you know you go you go from ship from port to port and unless you tell people and if you arrive safely in the, the second port nobody knows whether there was a storm on your way they're just going to assume you were fine unless you tell them that there was this storm and that storm and I realized that so-and-so had been missed off of a distribution list and actually we need their approval to get that project through because otherwise, Christ, if they don't see this, then it's all going to be a delay. And if we don't yeah. hit that milestone and all of that kind of stuff, and you're doing all of that kind of stuff day in, day out, but if nobody knows about it, then it doesn't exist. Yeah. And so the people who get the promotions are the people who know how to make their work visible. And it's, it's such a big life skill. And you mentioned, you know, does it tend to be the men who get these promotions? And um, yeah, because men aren't told not to show off when they're children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, it's ingrained in us oh, as women is. typically. Yeah, yeah. It is. But I mean, I don't know if your childhood was like mine, where I, I can remember being a kid and one of my uncles saying to me, you know, when you see uncles that some family do and they're like, oh, what can we ask the child about that we haven't seen for a year? Um, and it's, yeah, oh, how are you getting on at school? Are you clever at school? And I answered yes. And it oh, was like, no. oh, that was yeah, the wrong exactly. answer, Paula. <laughs> exactly, you don't say that. Yeah. Or another one, are you good at maths? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, don't say that. Mm. You don't say that. But I am good at maths. Why can't I say that? Yeah. I am good at yeah. Um and but you know, I could see it in your face there going, Oh no, you don't say that. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> we don't yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah. And it is so deeply ingrained. You don't show off. Mm. You don't be bossy. Um I was uh <laughs> as a small child, apparently I was a bossy child. Um Haven't they rephrased uh, that now? Um <laughs> <laughs> saying don't tell a, a, a girl she's bossy, tell her she has good leadership skills or something. There's something to that effect. I've seen a meme about that. Yeah, yeah. All well, these things yeah. that we tell little girls. Yeah. But Oh, and the other word I really can't stand. Um, but no one ever said it about me because they only say it about small people. And I'm not small. I'm actually, I've never been small. I'm tall. Um, feisty. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feisty yeah. is a great word to diminish, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah. It's a great word to you know put put someone in their place, isn't it? 
so you know we wind up with with half of the population and i mean this is a gross generalization because a lot of boys are raised in the same way yeah not not to put themselves forward for a whole variety of reasons um but we, we end up with one group of people who are raised to wait to be noticed and another yeah. group of people who are, who it's not that they're raised to put themselves forward it's just that they're not told not to yeah and so it's perfectly natural to talk about what have you done this week well i did this and i did this and i did this meanwhile a lot of women that doesn't come naturally yeah 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 something that's kind of uh, i suppose occurring to me now and something that i talk about a lot is this idea of the impact that you have and the role of managers in in identifying and setting really clear expectations mm. for people but also linking what people do on a day-to-day -day basis to the objectives of the organization to the objectives of the team and what it is that that the company as a whole is trying to achieve but making that really clear link do you think something like that would make it easier for for people in general but but women specifically to talk about their achievements at work um yeah, I I think having a really clear view of the of the line between what you are doing in your role, yeah, and the outcome is yes. so it, it's so important, yeah, for motivation, um, for you know a, a sense of achievement, that sort of thing, um, I suppose because my yeah because my background is is healthcare and pharmaceuticals there is quite a sort of direct line to well if we don't keep this product in stock people die so yes. it's, it's at least in in the area that i worked in for the last 10 years of my pharmaceutical career it was very much if we don't have product they die yeah um so it's quite easy then to connect what you're doing with a specific outcome um <clears throat> would that help people i don't know I don't know because does it help them talk about their achievements? What's I suppose what's in it for them in terms of talking about their achievements? They need the positive reinforcement from the manager. Yeah. That that that's what the manager wants from them. So if I'm talking to managers, what I what I would normally kind of say is if someone isn't coming forward in one-to-ones to talk about and, and saying what problems they've solved this week or what challenges they've overcome, ask them. Yeah. yeah <laughs> ask yeah. them to, you know, I expect you to bring to your next one-to-one -one two challenges you've overcome this week or two things that would have gone wrong if you hadn't been there. Just to get people in the habit of it. Yeah. Of talking about their achievements and talking about their work and actually linking what they do on a day-to-day -day basis to changing the course of a project or because yeah. it's so easy to fall into the habit of thinking well everything's on track it's fine yeah because you, you have yeah, proactively exactly. identified that there would have been an issue in this scenario and and if you're anything like me you kind of once you do something you sort of forget it and yes. exactly <laughs> yeah. that if, if everything is on track and there's no issues you don't really think to talk about them but it's it's a really interesting viewpoint i think that you know as an individual be prepared to discuss those kinds of things because they are part of your job especially the more senior you get as, yeah. you, as you mentioned earlier paula but also as a manager actually proactively inquire to people like i remember sitting yeah in management meetings or in one-to-ones with my manager also with my direct reports and you're just kind of going through a list of tasks that they have on you don't really talk about anything yeah. else maybe on a quarterly basis you talk about career development and opportunities and, and things like that but i always felt being in a, a smaller office in ireland part of a global agency but didn't really get the visibility of the opportunities that were out there from a global perspective mm. And I mean, you've just reminded me of, of, of something that happened with a manager of mine where, you know, we had a good working relationship. I'm not complaining about him at all. <laughs> we did. I'm not just thinking, oh, God, what if he listens? Um, we did have a good working relationship, but there was a big, big supply issue on 
the medicine that I was managing. And so I called in supply chain managers, the people who, you know, who have access to all the data about what stock is where. And we were all in a room together and yeah, the supply managers and I would, were just kind of, we drew a big map on the wall and we went, we've got this much here and we've got this much here and did it. And I was going, well, what if you move that from there to there, because they share a pack and you can hit there to here to here. And I mean, well, my manager was like, oh my God, this is, this is great. I don't need to do anything. Oh my God. And I was more sort of, well, what did you think was going <laughs> to Because yeah, but you, you're totally, you're totally in charge. And that was kind of what made me think, well, of course I am. Yeah. Why did you what, not think? What did he expect? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that actually that day changed our working relationship quite a lot because he was okay. like, oh, I, I just haven't, I haven't witnessed this side of you before. It's yeah. like, yeah, but this is what I'm doing day in, day out. And I guess I'm not showing you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really interesting. And it's kind of, you know, to, to kind of bring it back to a more general setting, like trying to explain to someone what you do on a day to day basis at work, yeah. like no one ever really gets it. Um, no. Even if you give a job title or something, no one really knows what it is that you're doing on a day to day basis. Like, I mean, we could talk about skills on a for a whole other podcast episode, the different kind of skills that are required, the transferable skills, all of that kind of thing. I'd love to come back to this idea of visibility. And and do you see any fears around being more visible? Because, again, something that comes up when I talk with with um, clients in relation to imposter syndrome, visibility is one of the yeah. triggers. And as we progress through our yeah. careers, we become more visible in especially, you know, in organizations, well, in entrepreneurial settings as well. But in organizations, the higher you get, the more visible, the more eyes that are on you. Uh, so if you mess something up or if you say something, it's amplified throughout that organization. Yeah. So any any thoughts around the fears associated with talking about our stuff, um, first of all, but then maybe also related to as we progress our careers, the fears around being visible. It's um, the fear around being visible is quite, is well, as you say, it's completely normal and natural yeah. Yeah. and and it happens. And for me, it's linked to a few things. So as you, you know, as you're talking about imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome, as you know, is linked to not feeling like you belong, not feeling like you're the same as everybody else in the room yeah. for whatever reason. So, you know, it, it could be ethnicity, sexuality, whatever, um, gender, but for, or background, but for what, whatever reason you feel like you don't belong. And so therefore you kind of feel like I'm going to get found out mm. and so you're scared about sticking your hand up for something because yeah, you're going to get found out. Then people will realize and... that you have no idea what you're talking about. You're a total fraud <laughs> and you don't belong here at all. <laughs> yes, exactly. They'll, they'll, they'll notice. Um, so yeah, that it's a normal thing. Um, I do sometimes talk through with clients about what is the worst that could happen? Mm. What's the worst that could happen? And what will you do if that, you know, really unlikely worst happened? And quite often it sort of comes out, oh, actually, yeah, that, that isn't that bad, is it? It's not that bad. Or, I mean, and this depends on the person. Um, or working through, what do we think of other people who stick their head above the parapet? And where do those thoughts come from? And th this relates back again to the whole being told that um, in your childhood that you should behave in a certain way. And then if you see other people behaving in a way that doesn't fit with that, how do you feel about those people and about um, being that woman <laughs> or that lady mm. that says, I did that I was, yeah. and I did a good job. Yeah. Um, there is, if you haven't come across it, there is a, a fantastic resource available from Google and it's free free workshops called I am remarkable. Oh and yes. Yeah. 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 They are fabulous. And they, under, you know, they work, do a lot of work in this area in terms of, um, realizing that sometimes our fear of visibility is that other people will judge us the same way that we judge them. And, yeah. and that's quite uncomfortable realizing that about yourself. And if you can, if you, once you see about yourself that, oh, actually I'm, I'm 
judging others with maybe not the greatest positive intent. Um, that once you start to look at other people with more positive intent and more, and you know, in a more positive aspect, then it becomes easier to look upon yourself in the same way as well. In terms of just, I'm only stating a fact here. I did this, the results were good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love and, that. And it, but is it is it also something to do with we will think that other people will judge us the way we judge ourselves? Quite possibly, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I full transparency. I I've done a lot of work with myself on mm. that. Yeah. In terms of getting past a fear of judgment, um, and you know, no one is ever completely beyond it because we'd be a psychopath. This is it. I think it's part of the journey, isn't it? But you just need <laughs> yeah. to learn to to kind of accept it, accept yourself and and know that judgment is is kind of part of it. But and it's, also it's... judge yourself differently. So I think perfectionism is is quite yeah. Learning and accepting that good enough is good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Things it. Won't I mean, perfectionism be totally associated with imposter syndrome i like to think of myself as a recovering perfectionist i like everything to be 100 percent. and uh, I, I i talk about that um or i was talking about that recently and when i think then of i do duolingo every day to to kind of keep my spanish up to date and and oh, wow. keep it going uh, i'm nearly at 365 days now so i'm delighted um brilliant delighted with that but when i do <laughs> And, and but... a couple of stories around this. So when I get 100%, it says perfect. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, so there is that kind of gives the message that there is such thing as perfect. And I just remembered another instance where I got 96% in a paper that I wrote. And it was my first time writing a paper in, I don't know, 20 years, something like that, mm. maybe That's close fantastic. to 20 years. Exactly. But the way, <laughs> the way my brain went and my mom quickly as soon as anything picked this up she was like you're wondering where that other four percent went and i was like of course i am i got so close to 100 percent. where's that other four percent it's just yeah <laughs> uh, i i that's past Eva as opposed to present Eva. <laughs> but i you know i'm i'm moving away from that perfectionism um i but can yeah, see no, you almost itching yeah, all over yeah. going, oh, where, 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 it, where did it where did it go where's and i'm kind of yeah feeling your yeah. discomfort where did it how, go <laughs> how can i be more perfect how can i do it um the other thing paul i wanted to come back to is this idea of sticking your head above the parapet mm. and in australia especially i don't know if it's in in the uk and i don't think it's as common in ireland but they, they call it the tall poppy syndrome yeah when someone when someone grows you know when the the poppy is a little bit taller the people around them want to just cut them down um yep. Now, in again, in my kind of more recent work on myself, my understanding of that is when you feel like you want to tear someone down, it's more because you're envious or you're jealous of yep. what they've achieved. And it's an indication, nothing more than an indication of what you want for yourself. And you need to think about what actions can I take to achieve that as opposed to being jealous, being envious. What you want is to support those people because they're doing what what it is that you want to do and how can you actually learn from them um yes i would agree with that where um thank you yeah thinking particularly in the corporate workspace yeah. for yeah. example when there are there are certain people who are put on a key talent track so whether they're graduate trainee programs or, or whatever and they do get a lot of extra resource and a lot of extra support and a lot of extra you know attention but if they're not actually doing a decent job they will not get promoted so yes they have opportunities that other people don't have but they do still have to live up to them yeah and and yet you, what the mutterings that you quite often hear are well you know, you know they are, who the hell do they think they are or this <laughs> that kind of thing and as you say you can't change the system. It's well, you can't immediately change the system, potentially yeah. long term. You can't change the system today. So what can you do today to talk about how do I get that sort of support? Who do yeah. I need to talk to? What do they need to see? 
um, and are they willing to give me the opportunities to do to go for it? Because there is often this sense that it's a manager that leads a one to one. It's a manager that leads an appraisal or an objectives discussion and or a development discussion. And it's not. It really should be the person who who leads it, who has a sense of what do I want from this conversation? Um, what do I want from you? What can you do for me, dear manager? Um, where do I want to go? Do I have your support? If I don't have your support, what do you need to see to get your support? Um, and how, what actions will you take to help me do those things? And if you don't ask for them, you don't get them. And again, I think that's a lesson that a lot of us learnt the hard way. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, January always brings a little flurry of people getting in touch about either their appraisal or their objectives. Yeah. And, you know, there's often a theme around, well, I hit all my objectives. So we ticked every box, but my manager is still giving me a rubbish appraisal because yeah. they said, well, your objectives weren't as challenging as everybody else's. So, well, you can sense that frustration. Well, you, dear manager, agreed to them. Yeah. So, but there's some responsibility as an individual as well to say, are these, are these objectives appropriate for me and the level I'm at? Um, what would you add that would give me a bit more challenge or development? Mm. Where could I develop further? What are your expectations for me to hit such and such a level? And, and to have those conversations throughout the year. Yeah. Cause you should never be having that kind of thing as a surprise at the end of the year. And that, that sits on the manager actually. Yeah. 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 It shouldn't be a surprise. No, no, but... definitely not. No, no. You need to get feedback throughout, throughout. I yeah. mean, could have a different conversation about how various different things are are done because that has happened to me in the past where i gave uh i gave one of my direct reports a, a particular rating and then it was taken away and discussed in a quiet room calibrated and then the feedback came to me saying uh, actually we've we've downgraded this let's say and oh. you have to have that conversation and it was like Okay, but I haven't had that conversation up to now. So now is a very difficult conversation to have that and explain uh, the impact. Obviously, without sort of saying, oh, well, it wasn't my decision, you know, and, and so accepting full responsibility for something that wasn't actually my decision. But uh, yeah, that's just how things were done there. So that was that was rather frustrating. Um, but I, I, I totally see what you're saying. You do need to have those conversations throughout. But, but I love this approach of um, or this advice that, you know, as an individual contributor, you need to step up and take responsibility for managing that meeting, for getting yeah. across what it is that you want from your manager. And I know certainly when I have done that in the past, it's been uh, quite a struggle. There was an agreement there. This is mm. in a job that I loved, but a blip, let's say, of a year long manager who I despised. Uh, we didn't get along very well at all. He and again, he was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you'll definitely be promoted. Let's do let's work on this for three months. And so we were meeting weekly for three months. I was coming to him and saying, oh, and I, I did this and I did this and I did this. And then we got to the end of that time period and I said, OK, so how am I doing? Oh, uh, no, I'd have to check the job description or something like he kind of deferred to going back. And yeah, it was just a uh, I think again, his first time managing people. Yeah. So not not a great approach. I thought I was taking responsibility. I thought I was being really proactive in well, it. Well you were. And and yet still ended with this. Any any kind of thoughts on that from a I suppose maybe it's it's leaving people with the sense of if I'm if I'm a manager, how can I manage these situations a little bit better? And then we'll we'll talk about the, the individuals then. So I mean as a manager um, the situation that you, that you spoke about in terms of where, you know, an appraisal got downgraded outside of your control, that, that is pretty tough. Yeah. Um, I know, I do know that a lot of organizations do sort of a bell curve on, um, on ratings because they say, well, you can't have everyone 
I know. having met their objectives. But it, but it makes the conversation okay. easy. That's the problem that if you give everyone an outstanding or a five out of five or a three out of three, from a manager's perspective, it's like, it's so I don't have to have that difficult conversation. But yeah. I mean, again, this whole rating system and performance management, the way we do stuff, that's a conversation for, for another day as well. Yeah, that, yeah. Don't get me started on that one. You know, when you work <laughs> in a team of eight and you get told, well, you know, at least one or two of you is going to get the bottom rating. Doesn't yeah. matter how well you've done. Exactly. So yeah. That's yeah, not yeah. on. No one wants to hear that. It's so demotivating. So yeah, demotivating. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't get me started. Okay, okay. Rabbit <laughs> hole. Um, in ter- yeah, in terms of, of that, I suppose the question is, as a manager, how, you know, how aware is someone that that could happen? Um, you know, cause I don't want, you know, sort of, I'm certainly not sitting in judgment of any manager who gets blindsided by their higher ups going, no, you can't have that. Yeah. But I suppose, you know, you live and learn. What are the questions I need to ask my higher ups in terms of, you know, what remit, what is my remit in terms of, um, gradings? Do I tell, am I to tell my staff, this is what I'm recommending for you? Yeah. And using those words rather than saying, no, this is what you've got yeah. in terms of a grading. Um, so I think, yeah, more in terms of what's the learning, because I yeah. don't know that you can really preempt that. Can no, you? no, I didn't. I didn't know that that's how things were done. And I, and I still, even when I received that feedback, I still didn't know exactly how things were done until I found myself on that leadership team. And I saw firsthand how the yeah. ratings were decided. And I was blown away because, yeah, I mean, again, a story for, for another day, um, but just how things were done was so subjective and yep. really like. Well, yes, yeah, that again comes, is a topic for another day, to, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, it comes back to this um, idea of visibility as well, Paula, because the people who were more visibly putting across what it was they were achieving, whether that was to their manager or to the wider business, were more likely yeah. to get the higher ratings. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think and and rating, yeah, and I mean, it's sort of appraisals with within teams and stuff. You can't blind them in the same way that you would say blind it um, in a psychology experiment. But when it is blinded in psychology experiments, so whether you blind CVs, so or or switch genders mm-hmm. on CVs yeah. or that kind of thing. It has a massive impact on what kind of advice or what kind of feedback is given and how what the judgment is on someone's performance. So you know, gender does come into it, race does come into it. Um, the judgment of a CV if you put an obviously sort of Asian name on something versus a very obviously British name. Yeah. Is very different. Same with a female name versus a male name then their achievements are viewed very differently. Yeah. And Paul, Paul Sheridan. <laughs> wow. His achievements are outstanding. Paula Sheridan. Oh, I, oh I don't there's, know. yeah. I don't know what was that. it? There is, <laughs> there is a good one. Oh, it was a scientist. Um, and he was a, a trans man hmm. and he, <laughs> one of his colleagues overheard some people muttering after he transitioned, some people, um, sort of chatting while he was presenting some of his work. And they were sort of saying, oh, you know, th- this chap is a lot better than his sister. And it's like, oh. well, same person. Yeah. Yeah. Same person. Yeah. You're yeah. just judging it. Yeah. Judging it differently. Yeah. The expectations yes. that we have of men, the expectations that we have of women. Yes. But I mean, as a manager, things to be aware of are those sorts of biases. But then also being aware of what kind of feedback do you give? So how concrete is the feedback that you're giving your people? Um, Are you feeding back to individuals? Uh, The one that women get is be more confident. Meanwhile, the one that men might get is um, speak up um, in meetings, run meeting sessions, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're looking for the same outcome. Yeah. Yeah. But you're not telling women how to do it. Yeah. Um, and so that comes up a lot. Again, in terms of viewing viewing gaps in development, um, 
for men, they tend to be viewed as, oh, this is a development opportunity for you. You're ready for this job. Yeah. Whereas in women, it's viewed as, no, this is a gap. You need to yes. fill this gap before you can, you can apply yeah. for it. Yeah, and, yeah. and again, those, those sorts of things tend to trigger people um, seeking support as well Is well, I was told not to apply for such and such a job because I didn't have experience of this, but the person they've hired does not have experience of this. Yeah. yeah. So, but I was told not it's to apply. It's mixed messages then. You're saying one thing for one person and another thing for yeah. someone else. And it's, again, does it come back to the individual manager's judgment of what yep. experience you do have or what you can do? And yeah. Yeah. And, and when you're in it and, and in the process and, you know, and I'm out of the corporate environment now, so it's a lot easier to kind of see all the places I went wrong with yeah, this yeah, in yeah. terms of not really not showing what I was capable of, of, of what I was doing, because yeah. then when people did like, like the manager I mentioned earlier, did see me doing things that I thought, well, I do this all day, every day. Yeah. They'd be like, oh my goodness, I had no idea you know your leadership and your ability to do this and ability to do that and it's like well yeah i was just doing it every day yeah yeah and i think i mean again this is kind of a slightly off topic but also related that sometimes when we have a strength we don't realize that it's a strength because it's something we do quite easily yeah. and quite naturally and we don't think to to tell people about it because it comes so easily and naturally yeah. to us yeah it's it's the unconscious competence isn't it yeah 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 and and that's when the frustration kind of going back to the beginning here that's where the frustration comes in of someone less experienced getting promoted is there but they're all they do stuff why are they getting lauded for things that i do day in day out why yeah. is this being held up to the rest of the team as something brilliant i do this yeah. all the time yeah yeah and um so yeah i mean the ways the ways to start to let to recognize what you do and what your skills are, are are things around having the conversations about well what did you do today literally what did you do who did you talk to what was the conversation about and why did you have that conversation and you can kind of then get into oh so you were anticipating risk you're mitigating mm -hmm. yeah you're seeing you know you're stepping above and seeing the bigger picture yeah and and you're networking you're building relationships with others you're very good at understanding what what the needs of the other person are so that if you do have to have a difficult conversation, you can kind of meet them where they are in a way that will get, you know, will get the point across to them and, you know, all of that sort of thing is stuff that people are probably doing without even realising. Hmm. Yeah, this is it. This is it. Um, any more thoughts from a manager perspective of how they can sort of facilitate this and, and then we'll, we'll go on to the individual. Um, I think the facilitating bit is in your team, if you've got more than a couple of direct reports, you've probably got, you've got your high flyer coming through yeah. Um, yeah. and part of the issue with them is curbing their enthusiasm. Okay. Yeah. Like, yes, I'm going to come through and I've done this and I've done that. And, and I want my next challenge and, and kind of, as someone I spoke to said, you know, trying to get it across to them in a way that doesn't dampen their fire, that actually you've only been here six months and that project's been going on for a lot longer than that. So no, you did not do all of that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so dampening some of it down. Yeah. Then you've also got the ones who are really struggling and really need some support and they do need some support. And then you've kind of got the lost middle. And, and these people are the, that I work with, they're the lost middle. They're the ones who don't cause you any problems. Um, so where can you carve out a little focus time for the people who, who aren't causing you any problems? And what, that, difference yeah. would, what difference would that make to you and to them to take them forward? Yeah, because so they're not the, they're not necessarily the highly, highly enthusiastic. They're not necessarily on the, the high flyer track or the uh, high potential, but actually. But they have potential. Exactly. That you, you if just you haven't focus seen them, it. them, give them, give them the resources that they need, give them the support that they need in order to yeah. take that to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. They, they do need that support well they they will flourish with mm. just a little bit of help in learning how to sell themselves yeah and if they yeah. look good then you look good yeah this is it um now coming on then to individuals so we spoke about the kind of the fear around the visibility um you know the, the difficulties of the ingrained beliefs that we have about speaking up our, on our own behalf and, mm. and tooting our own horns any uh, any advice for what individuals can do so if they if they wanted to start getting better visibility at work if they wanted to not be overlooked when it comes to promotion time if they want to progress in their career but without feeling like they're they're kind of what's the word i'm trying to look for? what's the word i'm trying to use um would i kind of progressing in their career but would i feeling like they're they're kind of being overly confident let's say yeah they don't want to be that person they don't want to be that person and i think we all know yes. who that person is yes because we all know <laughs> that person yes um and they we don't want to be them um i think feeling safe is a really important thing so okay, yeah. if you if you trust your manager then maybe your manager is the place to start if if you don't feel that you want to make yourself that vulnerable to your manager initially or if it makes you feel scared then practice with someone that you do trust mm. and practice talking about achievements and saying them out loud um so you know i mentioned i am remarkable earlier i am remarkable the workshops they are fabulous i do yeah. facilitate them and um they are free they are awesome and I am remarkable sort of will will show you why why talking about your achievements does not make you that person yeah. bragging about your achievement bragging about stuff that you haven't achieved makes you that person yeah. but simply saying i did this and the result was that is not bragging it's just a statement of fact and it's and it's okay so Look at it as though if you were preparing for an interview, you would go through line by line on the job description and come up with examples for it that, you know, things you've done that fit that job description. And so maybe start in that kind of way with just some core parts of your own job description with achievements for each of them. And there's any number of different acronyms for how to structure achievements. Mm. But um, and the one I quite like is the SOAR acronym. So S-O-A-R. So what was the situation? And what was either the obstacle or the opportunity, depending on your mindset, um, or the challenge? What did you do? Not what did we do? What did you do? And then what was the outcome? Ideally with a, resu with, um, a quantifiable result. So if it is something like noticing that an important person has been missed off a distribution list. So the situation is that for Project X, I noticed that the um, regulatory person hadn't been involved in any of the meetings, yet we need their sign off. So the, um, the problem was that if we don't get their sign off, then we miss this milestone. Hmm. So what I did was I contacted them. I sat down with them. I took them through the project to date um they have given us some feedback and some modifications to make but they say it's fine for them to go into the next round of edits the result is that we will hit that milestone and we won't lose i don't know hundred thousand pounds yeah and yeah it feels like a very simple thing that probably that you know you would do in the day in your day-to-day -day job but the impact is big yeah i think just noticing those things and maybe jotting them down i know certainly Thinking back to my corporate days, I always had a reminder in my calendar every month to be like, OK, so what have I achieved this month? And I just think, oh, I'll do that next month, next month, next month. And then we get to November where I have to fill out my appraisal. And you go, oh, I haven't yeah, done exactly. anything all year. <laughs> so this is a, a lesson, folks, if you uh, start writing those achievements down so you well, remember them. One, one um, way I really like is is catching raindrops. So the person who, who explained it to me was this around planning your time and, and, and planning your agenda. And at the start of the day, you know, 
just say, here are the two or three things, no more than four things that I will have achieved by the end of the day. So mm -hmm. these are the core priorities. And then at the end of the day, you, you work out what you need to do the next day, but you also review the day. And this shouldn't take more than five or 10 minutes. And what you do is you gather raindrops. And raindrops are all these, uh, the little positive things, little achievements throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So even if it is, I replied to the email I've been putting off for a week, um, gather all of those things. And he calls them raindrops because on their own, they are nothing. But you get enough of them and they'll break it down. Yeah. And if you get in the habit of gathering your raindrops at the end of the day, you it gives you a real, it gives you your good old dopamine boost, but it also shows you that you have achieved things in the day. And all those little things do add up. Yeah. And they, they do make a difference. And especially if you do it in writing. I mean, we spoke earlier about I I write lots of notes and things. Yeah. <laughs> but especially if you do it in writing, because you can flick back through the pages and go, yeah, well, I did do a lot, didn't I? Yeah. I did do a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes we get to the end of the day and think that we haven't achieved that much or we were busy in meetings all day and we feel like yeah. we were really busy. Um, but it's thinking about what was what was the achievement? You know, what did I yeah. actually get done here? You know, what's, what difference did I make? And well, I mean, again, for another podcast episode, why was I in that meeting if it, if it wasn't <laughs> beneficial? <Yes. laughs> um, and, you know, that's come up time and time again, um, <laughs> this whole idea. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think I like this idea of it's someone that you trust. So if yeah. your manager isn't necessarily the immediate person that you trust and you need to build up that confidence in talking about what you've actually achieved, then yeah, find find that next best yeah. person and, and start having those conversations and, and start kind of practicing about that. Um, and you're so right, like if it's stuff that you have actually achieved and, and maybe going back to our earlier point about this idea of n not knowing your strengths because you're living them all the time and you don't yeah. sometimes realize that you're your strengths sometimes it, it's beneficial to ask someone else, you know, what do you think well, that I do differently as well? Um, what, what makes the difference? Well, you know, what's the difference a question, I mm. a question I love for feedback purposes is what do you appreciate about working with me? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Because appreciate is such a lovely word, yeah. isn't it? Um, and you hear things in a different way rather than what are my strengths? Yeah. Um, and so that's a really powerful question. And then for the sort of the more development aspects, it's like, you know, what would make the bait, what would make the greatest difference okay, for me? Yeah, yeah. Because again, it's a positive spin. Yeah. People like giving positive feedback. So make it easier for them. Yeah. That's a but yeah, what, what of, do you appreciate it, about rather it? than saying, can I have some constructive feedback or can you tell me the areas I need to develop or, you know, people are kind of afraid to, to give yeah. that type of feedback in case it offends people. But normally when people ask for that and it's a brilliant thing, if you're not asking for feedback, it's a brilliant thing to do. Uh, treat feedback as a gift. Someone is is giving you their time, their, their opinion. Um, but I think people are afraid in case they offend the person but but usually if yeah. someone asks for feedback it's from a genuine place and they want to learn something and yeah. they want to progress and they want to do something differently they want to develop so so give that to them yeah and and when when someone answers the question what do you appreciate me or what's my strength believe them yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it. So don't, don't go, oh, they're just saying. No, they're not just saying. That. They're not just saying that because they're your friend. They're not just saying that because they work with you, because they're your colleague. Yeah. Um, yeah. If someone says something nice, it's, yeah, take it as it's from a genuine place. Yeah. Um, Paula, the question I ask everyone who comes on the podcast, what does being happier at work mean to you? Um, yeah, I had a bit of a think about this. <coughs> I mean, I'm happiest at work if I'm being challenged, but feel supported. Mm -hmm. So I, I can think of roles I've done that, yeah, there was a lot going on and yeah, it was very challenging, but it was brilliant yeah. because I had good support, good manager. Um, there's a huge thing about being valued and being treated fairly. Yeah. 
and um and being valued isn't just about pay yeah it's about yeah, recognition and again it recognition is. isn't Appre just an appreciation pay. yes and about feeling that you belong and that mm. you can you can just be you yeah yeah in what you know at work bringing the whole of yourself to work is really important yeah um, absolutely brilliant and if people want to reach out if they want to connect with you if they want to find out more about what you do sign up to an i am remarkable workshop or anything like that what's the best way they can do that and um, you can get in touch with me on linkedin where i am um i need to chat i'm paula hyphen sheridan on linkedin yes so linkedin then my profile is paula hyphen sheridan or just get drop me an email which is paula at unwrapping potential that's all one word dot com brilliant that's great thank you so much for your time today paula i so enjoyed Ooh, the thank chat thank you for having lots, me <laughs> lots and lots of nuggets for people i think to to hopefully put into action straight away uh, you know, to, to progress in their career or to create that environment where people feel that they can progress, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I just, yeah, I would love, I'd love a world where people get promoted on merit. Yeah. Entirely on merit. And for that to happen, we, we all need to learn to communicate what it is that is, that we do and the value that we offer. This is it. And it's it's really important and we all have to learn to listen to it as well yeah absolutely there's some really great parting thoughts there thank you so much thanks so much it's for your time been, today paula it's been great chatting Aoife thank you so much <laughs>